This is a one speaker meeting. Please welcome our speaker tonight. His name is Dallas. Hi, I'm Dallas, alcoholic. And um, let's see. I hear you want the raunchy stuff in there. Yeah. Well, I got plenty of that for you. I'll tell you that. Uh, okay. Let's just start with, I don't want to start back in my childhood. It's boring. And, you know, uh, I turned my life and will over to the care of drugs and alcohol at the age of 14. And uh, I didn't stop till I was 38. And I'm old now, so, you know, there you go. Um, <laughs> My point is, um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a musician. I'm a retired musician. I'm an ex-famous musician. And, uh, you know, I had a brief 15, actually I had 10 minutes in the, in the limelight. And uh, I, uh, you know, you, you give an alcoholic uh, an audience and they, we, uh, we get an ego, you know. Uh, I got here without anything. Um, I went from driving Ferraris and living up in the top of Mulholland, touring the world, I couldn't tell you what one place in the world looks like that I visited, except the bathrooms. I can tell you that. I know to this day what the bathrooms looked like uh, in Amsterdam and Paris especially. Paris especially. It was a nice bathroom. The blood on the ceiling really went good with the white towel. Okay, so I, uh, you know, I'm one of those guys that uh, when I told my grandmother when I was 11 that I was going to be a musician, she said, oh my God, you're going to grow up and be a junkie. <laughs> Swear to God. And, uh, you know, she, I, I, I heard that voice and it never left me. There was always that voice in, in the back of my head. And... I swore to my grandmother and everything I believed in sacred that I would never do heroin. That heroin was for losers and that heroin were like for only the scumbag people in the world, you know. I remember reminding myself of that in the methadone line. And, uh, uh, you know, I started off okay. You know, my first, the first album I did with this band was, uh, was a big hit, and uh, we, uh, they called us the American Beatles at the time. Now, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you, it's uh, a band called Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and the first album we did was without Neil Young, and therein lies the problem for me. Um, Neil, <laughs> I... Uh, I, it was working for me back then. It was working. I was young. I was 19 when we recorded that first record. It became a huge success. You couldn't go anywhere without hearing our songs on the radio, on the, on, on the, on the you know, the record players. The, the, it was everywhere. We lived up in Laurel Canyon, so, you know, the streets were, like, filled with our, our music, you know. Stuff like Our House and Guinevere and Long Time Gone and all those old, old, great old songs that are still selling <coughs> to this day. And what I took with and did with that is, now that's, that's what I really want to talk about. What I took with, for, uh, from that was uh, great disappointment, extreme 
disappointment and sadness because what I found out was what they promised me, which was if I could just be rich and famous, I would be happy. Rich and famous equals happy. And I can't tell you it's the furthest thing from the truth. I, uh, somebody open this for me, please. I'm, man, I'm old and I can't do this. I, you'll find out why in a minute. Um, and if I stumble around, it's because I'm old and I'm dizzy. I get dizzy when I stand up, so I'm not loaded. I, I promise you that. <laughs> well, maybe a little on the meds. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I, uh, I took that, that success and, and, and felt that loss and that, that utter hopelessness at that point. Now, that doesn't make any sense, does it? You'd think, here's a guy with all the money he could possibly spend and uh, all the uh, adoration he could possibly use, you know, played at Woodstock, first Woodstock, you know, half a million people out there looking at me and uh, I couldn't see them because it was night and, and, and it was very scary for us, you know. It was our second gig, and uh, I uh, turned that into my worst nightmare. Uh, right about then, uh, about the same time the, the first album came out, somebody, uh, a friend of mine, a musician, who was I was recording on his album, brought in, I was doing a song, I was doing a take, a song he wrote about me, I was doing it, uh, recording it, overdubbing the drums, and uh, he brought this white powder in. And, uh, you know, I remember he gave me, he said, here, Dallas, try this. This will make you feel better. And, you know, this will give you energy. And I thought, wow, I'm kind of tired, you know, I smoked too much pot, I drank a little too much. And I think uh, this would probably help me. Well, I snorted that stuff, and instantly my throat closed, and I couldn't breathe. And I thought, what the fuck is this? This is bullshit. I cannot understand why anybody would want to do this. And I asked him, could I have another one, please? <laughs> And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, can I have another one, please, in my story. That was the real beginning of my demise, you know. And what I understand is I was filled with self-loathing. And that's something I think we all share. Nobody gets here with low self-esteem. It took me five years to get up to low self-esteem. I shit you not. Five years. Uh, I got here behind a suicide attempt. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The, uh, the fact is, is that, uh, you know, we needed a, we needed a band to, uh, to uh, tour. And we asked a bunch of musicians, you know, a bunch of famous guys and all of them turned us down. They didn't think we were going to get anywhere. And so our managers suggested, well, why don't you get Neil Young? And I got kind of this, this not that I have anything against Neil, mind you. Uh, uh, I got this kind of sick feeling in my stomach, and I said to Stephen, I said, isn't that the reason Buffalo Springfield broke up? You guys used to get in fist fights all the time on stage. And he said, no, it'll be different this time. <laughs> oh, Stephen. Well, it started off really good, you know. Neil and I got along. Uh, Stephen and him were getting along. And right about the time we did the second record, which was called Deja Vu, we, uh, we started to really hate each other. And, and as, as it got crazier, so did the amount of cocaine. We never, we never equated the fact that everybody was going insane with the amount of cocaine we were doing and alcohol we were consuming. You know, I, I drank alcohol. I never, 
you can't call me, I was never a social drinker. I drank to get drunk the first time I tried beer. And I, I guess I was 14, you know, before I found uh, pot. And um, so the, how that went is in the middle of uh, that album, we, uh, we, we almost broke up. And, uh, no, and right about then, uh, Charles Manson had, had murdered uh, Sharon Tate and all those guys up there. You, this is a history lesson for you youngsters. And, uh, you know, it just went, 1969 turned from love and peace to lock my door and, oh, my God, they're going to fucking kill me. You know, that's where it went. Everybody in this country got paranoid after that. You know, especially us, because, you know, David knew Sharon, and he was heartbroken, you know. It started, the problems with David started with when his, the love of his life, Christine, was killed in a car accident in the middle of recording Deja Vu. Now, it's a, granted, it's a beautiful album. You would never guess that we were going through such turmoil and such heartache. You know, I sat behind the drums, and this is why I picked the drums, because I could have them in front of me, between you and me, and I felt safe. You know, I felt safe, but what it made me was an observer. So I got to see, you know, it's kind of like the lost child in the family, the, the, the middle child who, who gets ignored, and but knows exactly what's going on and the guy who ends up being an alcoholic and an addict later because he just can't believe every the world around him and uh you know i it's uh the band broke up after our first gig neil walked off stage and uh and uh you know i flew back with uh steven and the next thing I knew, you know, they had fired Stephen, and I sided with Stephen. The next thing I knew, I was out, you know. The big shots from New York came out and said, I'll break your legs if you don't finish this tour. And he was, he was serious. He was not kidding. You know, this was like uh, the record companies and the mafia were one and the same back then. And uh, so... I found myself once again out of my family. I found myself, you know, it, it wasn't enough that I found my mother dead when I was 12. It wasn't enough that I heard about my father's be, being killed in, a, in an air show doing a stunt where the engine quit on him. Uh, I heard it on the radio. It wasn't enough that I got married the day before my 16th birthday. But this was the, the coup de grace for me. This was the final straw. That's when I made the conscious decision that I was going to kill myself with drugs and alcohol. I didn't have the balls to shoot myself in the head. Although there were many nights when I had that gun, that 38, pointed at my head, I could not pull the trigger. Because I'm a wimp when it comes to pain. And I'm sure it was going to hurt. I, I probably doesn't, but, it, you know, that's what, I, that's, what I, uh, that's what I thought. I mean, you're dead. You're not going to feel anything. And uh, so I, uh, I made that conscious decision, locked myself up in my big house up on the hill, and, and proceeded to self-destruct. And I felt okay because I thought the royalties were going to keep, continue to come in. You know, my, my financial situation wasn't going to change. And we'll, uh, we'll go to 1984 um, Thanksgiving. I had been in and out of rehab. I had nothing. I had sold my drums for a small bag of bunk heroin. 
I had, I had uh, lost everything. The only reason I wasn't sleeping under a bridge was because I was able to manipulate women. And I could convince them, and they thought so too, because, you know, after all, I'm Dallas Taylor. You know, let's bring him in. All the codependent women came out like you wouldn't believe. They came out and said, let's take him in, fix him up, and we'll all be rich and famous again, you know? And it just never happened. It just never happened, you know? I've been married six times, by the way. That's the, uh, that's the truth of it. <laughs> I didn't give up. That's the thing. That's the thing. I didn't give up. Uh, I find, you know, I uh, one of my marriages lasted for two weeks, and the only reason it only reason it lasted for two weeks is because we were on an island and couldn't get the fuck off it. And uh, and this is all in sobriety, guys. You know. This is all in sobriety. So 1984, I, I, uh, I, I have my first experience with smoking cocaine. And this, we, did, we had free base. We didn't have crack back then. And this was my, my, my last night using. Uh, I, had lived, I was living in a, in a shack on Silver Lake Boulevard that once was occupied by Squeaky Fromm, who was a member of the Charlie Manson gang. And uh, boy, the, the vibes in there were something else, I'll tell you. I know there were bodies buried there. I just never thought to dig them up. And, and so I, uh, I, I made a conscious decision that night. I had a moment of clarity a moment of clarity. And I had, I had an out-of-body experience. I had just drank a fifth of booze. I had just smoked a bunch of cocaine, and I was stone sober. I could not get high. And I had that moment of clarity. I can't get high anymore, and I can't stop. I cannot picture my life without doing something. And that was my battle cry. I cannot picture my life without doing something. Nobody, I used to, I went to my first AA meeting via treatment center in 1972, and I was convinced everybody was in there secretly using. Some of them were. But I could not fathom the idea of living a life without taking something. I, I felt too much. I felt... You know, I was, it was as though my nerves were on outside of my skin. I, I was hypersensitive to my surroundings, which is, you know, in later years in recovery has worked to my advantage because I'm able to, I'm able to, you know, be aware of my surroundings and kind of get out, get away from situations that I think might not be too cool. And so I, uh, Remember going into this liquor store on the corner of Sunset and um, and uh, uh, Silver Lake, and it was run by my then wife's uncle. And I remember going in there, and went, they were playing one of our songs over the PA. And I and I walked in and I said, "You hear that? That's me," you know. Somebody give me twenty dollars. <laughs> Always reaching high, I was, man. In fact, I, I signed away a couple million dollars worth of record sales and, and percentage points for ten thousand dollars for heroin just to get well. You know, these were things that were weighing heavy on me, you know. What a piece of shit you are. What a fucking loser. That's what goes in my head. But it, it, it's not like it was any different than when I was five. 
That same voice went through my head. You're a piece of shit and you're a loser and you can't, everybody else is better than you. And that's what happened to me, you know. So I, I, I therefore self-destructed everything. You know, in my, um, in my fourth step, I discovered, I, I love the fourth step because I discovered that all my problems were of my own making. I did it, not them. They didn't fuck me over. I, I didn't take care of business. I, want, I needed to get high. It's not that I wanted to. By then, I needed to. You know that, I don't know when I crossed that line into want and need. I think it was, I remember my, I, I bought my, hi honey, I bought my first, uh, first ounce of cocaine back uh, before the second tour, and, and a friend of mine said, Dallas, you just bought yourself a mountain of heartache. And I, I looked at him dead serious and said, dude, I'm just being frugal. <laughs> it's more economic to buy it by the ounce than it is by the gram. And it made perfect sense to me. And it actually, it probably was, except for the fact that I did it in two days. <laughs> I did cocaine viciously. I would stick, I had, a, I had a buck knife, I would stick the cocaine up, rocks and all, pack it in my nose, and if it didn't stay there, I'd eat it. I would have shoved it up my ass if I thought it would work. <laughs> Probably would have worked, but... Uh, I don't know. I, 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 don't know. I don't think I. I don't think I could go that far. So it was uh, actually a better idea to shoot it. Made perfect sense. Well, it's a waste to snort it or smoke it. I never could understand my friends smoking it. it, it it's you're wasting it. You know, put it in a syringe, shake it up put it in that arm, and by then, I didn't even need a belt for, for, for my fixes. I didn't even need a belt. I had one, you can see it, I had one left that worked. And that's from 25 years ago. Um, I'd like to tell you that's the only consequence that I paid. The loss of my career, you know, I went from one of the most sought-after drummers in the, in the world to unhirable, unemployable. You guys have heard that? Uh, unemployable to um, suicidal. So that night in uh, 1984, I went back to that shack in, uh, in Silver Lake, and I went, uh, went back to the kitchen. It was dark. I couldn't see. And uh, I grabbed a butcher knife and I stabbed myself in the stomach. And I remember saying, I really wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> I instantly thought about people who jump off buildings, you know, and they change their mind halfway down and it's, you're fucked, man. So I had changed my mind after I stabbed myself and realized, boy, are you stupid. And I remember saying to my then wife, um, if I'm still alive in the morning, take me to the hospital. And she said, okay, and went back to bed. <laughs> and uh, by the way, she uh, died a few years ago of a cocaine overdose. They didn't find her for a week in, in the hot sun of Phoenix, Arizona. So, you know, this is no bullshit, guys. This is life and death. This is not about getting it back or her back or him back or, you know. It, it, it's about saving our ass. All my peers are dead. Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, all of them, Jim Morrison. These were friends of mine. And, and also, we, I remember 
in early sobriety feeling guilt, like a survivor guilt? Like, why the fuck is, did I, this piece of shit, get saved and they were taken? Well, what kind of God would do that, you know? Five years into my sobriety, I finally got it after three tries. Three strikes, you're out. Three tries. I know a guy who went through 48 treatment centers, and he's still sober today, so don't worry. Some of you got a ways to go, if you live. If you live. And therein lies the rub. So countless overdoses. Countless waking up with the paramedics working over me and bringing me back to life. I can't tell you how many times. And me saying, wow, that was a really good hit. And getting up and walking out. That was the kind of a dope fiend and alcoholic I am. I remember drinking so much alcohol that I know I had alcohol poisoning. And um, I don't know why I didn't die. So five years after I got sober, I had, my life was coming back together, as it does. It comes back together, you know? What do you, what do you think about that? You start getting your life back together. And if you never had your life together, you start to get a life. And I was getting a, life, a new life, not as a musician or a rock star, but as a counselor in recovery. That was what I fell in love with. I remember working on an adolescent unit in, uh, 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 in the valley. It was, it was called ASAP. And, and I just fell in love with those kids because they were me. And I could relate to them. I was you know, emotionally on their level, you know. I, I'm probably younger than that, you know. Perpetual adolescence, that's what we are. Perpetual adolescence. So five years, I'm getting to five years into my recovery, I uh, almost bled to death one night and uh, had to be taken to the hospital. I had a 104 temperature. And uh, I remember going into Cedar sinai vaguely. I remember it. And came to with this team of doctors, like a football team, all in white, standing around my bed, and said, well, Dallas, the good news is you stop bleeding. The bad news is you're in liver failure. And we give you about six months to live. Boy, tell, tell me I didn't go right to, I knew this fucking program didn't work. <laughs> Five years of counselor. I knew this program didn't work. You see, God let me down again. Took my parents, took my career, you know. It was all God's fault. Thank God I found AA because it, it taught me a new understanding of what a higher power is. It's not that God takes anything away from us. We have free will and choice, you know? The shit happens. People die. We don't know what happens after this, but I've come closer to it than I did when I was coming to uh, with all those ODs. They gave me six months to live strapped a pager on my belt and said, we'll call you when we get one. Now, I want you to know what that's like. Walking around six months with a pager on your belt, it's like being on death row waiting for a reprieve. Because I knew at any minute I could have another bleed and I could possibly die from that. Bleed to death out of every orifice. That's what you do in liver failure. Now, I know some of you newcomers are saying, oh, shit, man, I knew I wasn't going to get sober because I'm going to need a liver transplant now. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I said. You know, I heard the, I took, you know, whatever the speaker said, I took as, as reality, as my reality. You know, oh, God, 
you know, uh, now my, I go to the doctor, let's see if your liver's okay. You know, if you're still here, you're okay. If you're still what, getting up out of bed, you're okay. Uh, and that was 18 years ago. Now, I don't know anybody who's had a liver transplant longer than that. I asked a doctor once, what's the oldest living liver transplant? You know, he looked at me, very matter of fact, and said, you are. I am? Well, that's disheartening. <laughs> In fact, there are people in the program who, who have had liver transplants and they keep coming up to me, you still doing okay, Dallas? You doing okay? Huh? <laughs> Guys, my, uh, my sobriety has been very, very good to me, although you may think, what's good about a liver transplant? Well, I'll tell you, a liver transplant gave me the true meaning of living one day at a time. It gave me the true meaning of fellowship. You know, er, nobody would let me not speak places. I had to speak everywhere. And I bitched and moaned and, and you know, oh, I don't want to do, and every time I spoke, I felt better, you know. And uh, six months to the day I got that liver transplant, Six months to the day that I had that bleed, a 19-year-old kid was killed by a drunk driver, and I got his liver. And it was perfect. It was in perfect condition. Had to be. I'm still here. I'm still here. That's kind of what it was like. What it's like now, in, uh, in the last three years, it's been another bumpy ride. Been some more roadblocks in, in, in the road. Um, my now wife, Patrice, is sober longer than I am, you know, and reminds me of it on a daily basis. <laughs> Not in what she says, but her actions. Her actions. How she, how she behaves and how she, how she deals with life on life's terms, you know. Don't let anybody tell you that time don't matter, because it does. If you work it, if you work for it. It can be hell if you're not working. If you're not working the steps, it can be hell. You know, nothing worse than, than a, than a uh, uh, dry drunk, you know. I, I, I've talked to people, I said, man, please go get drunk. <laughs> um, three years ago, actually four years ago, um, I went to one of my many doctors, my football team of doctors, and this time they told me, Dallas, the, the meds that you're taking for your transplant have poisoned your kidneys, and you're now in kidney failure. <laughs> just, just believe this shit? And uh, I said, okay. By now, I'm kind of going, okay, well, well I'm, I'm on the train to the end of the station. Might as well, you know, what else? What else you got? Come on, bring it on. Uh, so my next visit was to... Um, a dialysis unit. Now I want you to tell to know how, exactly what the dialysis unit was. There was about 35 people in there, all very old, very sick, some delusional, some not knowing what, what talking about. Help me, Jesus! Help me, Jesus! And uh, I had to sit there for four hours where they ran my blood through a machine. And I couldn't move. And I, you know, I remember, th you know, of course, we, we're dope fiends. But they put a, a direct line into my heart. And you know the first thing I thought. <laughs> Where was that when I needed it? <laughs> okay. So, uh, 
You're in dialysis three days a week, four days a week. Um, we're now looking for a donor. Now, I want you to know that there are people who are waiting 10, 15, 20 years for a kidney. And God forbid you need a liver transplant today because it's about the same weight. And you've got to be near death before you get one. I was lucky. It happened 18 years ago when they still had the helmet law in. They, my, my, my team used to call them donor cycles. I rode for years. You know, it pissed me off when the helmet law came in. You know, <laughs> I couldn't let my hair blow in the wind. <laughs> and um, so we're looking around for donors. You know, I asked my, my daughter volunteered. I have three daughters and one son and four grandkids. I lost track. One daughter we just discovered. A little glitch in the, in the uh, past. It's rock and roll. And I say, <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, we're looking around, we're looking around, and, and my wife Patrice says, I want to test. I want to, I want to see if I'm, if I'm a, if I'm a possible donor. And I'll be goddamn if she didn't go in and test. And it turns out she's a match to me. And that woman. gave up a kidney for me. And that was three years ago. But I want to tell you about the bump in the road. You know, that was great. I got the kidney. I'm going to live now. The pain meds. <laughs> the fucking pain meds almost got me. I almost gave up 24 years. When they gave me that first shot of Dilaudid, you want to know the thought that went through my mind? Get rid of the wife, sell the dog, sell the house, see how much money you can, con co you can collect, go find an empty, abandoned building somewhere, and that's how you want to go out. I'm telling you, it, it, it was back as though I had never gotten sober, as though I had never done an intervention, as though I had never, you know, told many people along the line that this disease will kill you. It was, uh, it was, it was on. So, you know, I'm actually, I went into a deep depression after that, and, and, uh, and I'm just coming out of it, and I'm really grateful that Michelle asked me to speak because I haven't spoken in a long time and, and, and I'm glad it's this meeting because then I can be myself, you know. I don't have to watch my cuss words. And, um, you know, I, I don't get it. Um, I, um, I'm three years in. Patrice is okay. We're okay. You know, we made it through the death of our dog, you know. That's the longest relationship I ever had was this dog, 11 and a half years. You know, we just lost big old bloodhound, sweetest, you know. That, that, a pet will teach you about unconditional love. You gotta pick up the shit, you gotta, you gotta feed them, you, got, you can't go anywhere. You have, to, you have to get a babysitter. I mean, it's just like having a perpetual three-year-old. But we love that dog, especially Patrice. Love that dog like it was our own child. And boy, that was a rough one. That was a tough one. That just happened a few months ago. But here I stand. I'm still sober. I made it through the, the pain meds. And, if it, and, and I made it through all that shit, you know, in recovery, all the mistakes I made, you know, and... Uh, and here I stand, you know, I'll be 25 in um, December 22nd. And that's a, a, a miracle. No, don't applaud me, it's like applauding somebody who runs out of a burning building. 
<laughs> I love AA. You know, we, it's great um, because we should be encouraged. But I also thought in my, one of my cynical moments was, what the fuck are they applauding for? We just ran out of a burning building, you know? It's like, but it's good. And I want to encourage the newcomers. You know, the thing is, is it's over. It will never work again. Oh, it'll get you high. But it, the consequences outweigh the benefits. The consequences outweigh the benefits. It's as simple as that. And as long as I can remember that, you know, and make it through those, those surgeries and whatever else life has to, to, to throw my way, um, then I'll be all right. My wife and I have been married for 10 years. We're happy. We're in love, you know. It's a recovery house. So I want to thank you guys for letting me speak. I want to thank you for, for doing a 12-step call on me because I needed this, and I hope somebody got something out of it. Thanks.